I've been given, my name is Professor John May from the University of Warwick. I'm chairing uh, this panel, which is devoted to Joseph Priestley. Uh, we're under very strict instructions that nobody is to speak for more than 30 minutes as a maximum. I gather that if a librarian has never been executed in these libraries, speakers may be <laughs> 30 minutes. So I'll get out of the way very quickly. I'll introduce each speaker one after the other, and then there'll be a bit of time for questions at the end. But if that time gets eroded, there is time at the very end of the day. So I'm delighted to introduce the first speaker, is Professor Steve Bargrave from the University of Southampton, who, as we both our speakers, enlivened proceedings yesterday, and I'm very glad uh, to hear him talk about Joseph Priestley today. So thanks, Steve, over to you. Thank you. Cheers, uh, Thanks to uh, John and David and to the Leeds Library. I'm delighted to be part of this uh, event. Oh, I've just been handed a note. Dear Dr. Priestley, regarding your overdue... Oh, sorry. <laughs> not, not for me. Um, okay, uh, I'm actually not going to talk uh, except uh, tangentially um, about, uh, uh, about Priestley in relation to Anna Barbell. This, but this is a piece about religious uh, community, so, so bear with me. And do keep me to 30 minutes. No, I won't be. Okay. Um, uh, there are generic and even disciplinary issues in Anna Aiken Barbell's work that make it an interesting case for the rubric of, uh, of this, uh, this network. Um, and I want to start by just briefly touching on, on three issues. First of all, uh, the networks through which and within which dissenters uh, communicated. Secondly, the, uh, an issue that um, uh, occurred interestingly, I thought, in discussions we had yesterday in our sessions at the university, uh, the aesthetic. And thirdly, the way that uh, these things map on or don't map on uh, to gender. Um, now, Anna Barbold, it, uh, if you were a, uh, a student, it used to be that Anna Barbold featured, if at all, as the unimaginative killjoy moralist uh, of Coleridge's late anecdote about his ancient ma uh, mariner. So for Mrs. Barbold, read Mrs. Grundy. Uh, but there's a difference uh, in the way that students encounter her these days. Um, nowadays, I guess, they get um, her poem, a couple of poems, 1811, from Duncan Wu's ubiquitous uh, romanticism anthology, or the exchange with um, Mary Wollstonecraft over Barbold's poem To a Lady. Um, in groundbreaking studies, again, these were referred to yesterday, romantic period women's poetry, Stuart Curran in the 1980s and Marlon Ross in the 1990s both used the term uh, diurnal for its concerns. This was the thing that characterised uh, women's poetry. It wasn't concerned with the transcendental, with the ideal, but with daily uh, and recurrent activities. And for Curran, at least, Barbold was considered a blue stocking. Uh, and since that time, other people, uh, not least uh, our, our chair, uh, but also Isabel Armstrong and Malore uh, and others, have complicated uh, and even refigured that model. Now, my uh, approach to Barbold is, is, is through the poems, although I'm not really going to talk about the poems in this paper. I do want to talk about uh, religious uh, community. But um, the way in which we think about uh, the poems, of course, was changed by... Uh, their publication uh, in a, a definitive or a near definitive edition, uh, keeping added to, um, uh, in 1994. Uh, a broad view selection of the poems and prose in 2002, uh, both by Elizabeth Craft and Bill McCarthy, and then uh, McCarthy's biography of 2008. Um, then, ten years ago, uh, a bit more than that, the publication of the collection uh, Romantic Sociability, edited by Julian Russell and Clara Tewitt, opened up uh, a field of study. Uh, it was a volume that was ambitious to, to refigure uh, the, a model that had dominated 18th century studies for over a quarter of uh, a century, the model of Jürgen uh, Habermas and a kind of hierarchical public-private model. And it wanted to refigure that as a sort of interstitial model, a model uh, that clearly demonstrated the application of Marx's <coughs> axiom that changes in consciousness succeed and don't precede changes in the relations of production. Uh, Russell and Tewitt and their contributors, again, uh, John amongst them, suggest um, a collective authorship of works which are mediated at both ends by an audience, that's at, both at, uh, uh, production, <coughs> at the ends of production and consumption. And signification, in their view, is achieved by social networks, such as the circle around Elizabeth Montague, which included Barbold, or that later one, uh, which also uh, centred on Joseph Johnson, in which Barbold also featured from the late 1780s, after moving to uh, Hampstead. Uh, now, 
clearly, Barbold is a figure who can't be read in terms of that uh, aesthetic with which we're familiar, that masculine uh, uh, aesthetic of the romantic poem that values solitude, nature, novelty. So uh, we need uh, other terms. When I was a, a, an undergraduate, and even when I worked here in uh, Leeds, uh, we saw or uh, witnessed, I think, the radical re-reading of a canon that too often remained the same canon. You know, we were going back to read uh, the old texts in uh, new and funky ways. And I think that Barbold is an instance of the way a new canon, uh, or changes in the canon, call forth, necessarily call forth new interpretive resources. Um, that was uh, the, what I wanted to say about networks, which I'll, I'll return to. The second thing I wanted to talk about was, was, was the aesthetic. Uh, because, interestingly enough, we have to say that in looking at the cultural productions of dissenters, we are uh, looking um, rather at what Tom Paulin likes to call uh, the, the Protestant anti-aesthetic. Um, they are The dissenters are the descendants of those iconoclasts who, seeing such things as the graven images prescribed by the commandment, whitewashed the inside walls of churches, smashed stained glass windows, and beheaded sculptures of the Virgin Mary. And it hadn't struck me until yesterday when uh, John remarked on it how many uh, dissenting tutors were from Scotland, and that the route that the aesthetic took um, might be... Um, across the border, down the high road from Scotland. Now, priestly suspicion of uh, taste is a suspicion of something lax and even immoral, and at the same time is something liable to sort of creep in uh, unconsidered and influence you in ways uh, in which you wouldn't want to be, or he wouldn't want you to be influenced, a sort of ecumenical promiscuity. Uh, gender. The, the disagreement between priestly and barbel that I'm going to talk about can, uh, I think, readily, maybe too readily, be mapped onto uh, the gender terms that, that preceded it. I don't think it's enough to characterise Priestley, as, as some do, as argumentative, bluffly rational, you know, obviously masculine, while Barbell meekly advocates feeling and cooperation, because those clearly return mm -hmm. us, as I say, too readily to, to gender <coughs> terms. So... Th that was by way of introduction. I've talked about three things. The networks through which and within which dissenters uh, communicated, the aesthetic and, and gender. And of course, there's a relation between those things. Um, the emphasis on the way that meaning may be, as it were... Oh, sorry, I realised I should have had a... Uh, should be showing you pictures as I speak. These paper slides up with me. OK. Um, that's when I look at the picture of Barbara. Can we get this to work? I just want to go uh, forward one slide, but I should go to slide show. Yeah, yeah, I'd like you to. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. okay. This is the usual, uh, usual topos of the uh, technologically incompetent uh, <laughs> humanities academic. So, from yeah, I just go to slide show. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to use the thing from the wrong angle. <laughs> all this yeah. is being recorded on film, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> we can enjoy it all again. So yeah. Yeah. Thank you. The yeah, yeah, that's what I need. This is uh, yeah. this uh, Barbell, for those who haven't uh, seen this image, is a much more uh, famous uh, image of her as one of the um, nine living uh, muses, is the, the, the blue stocking Barbell. Um, okay, th there's a relation between those, those things, the, the idea of networks, the, the aesthetic uh, uh, and gender. Um, the, the emphasis that uh, I think everybody uh, in, in yesterday's uh, papers was taking on uh, meaning as, as it were, interstitial rather than emerging from uh, public and private spheres, has consequences for the sort of meaning that we get. Um, so that in the stuff I'm not going to talk about, which is uh, the poems, Barbell's rhetoric is characteristically based on second person uh, address. She speaks to a, a, a you. Um, so one reviewer wrote approvingly, her style is perfectly Horatian, uh, while also uh, approving uh, in the poems, what he called a masculine force, uh, and the civic imperatives implied by writing the tradition of Horace and Pope are evident in them. She didn't want to call her poems lyric, uh, which in her view was a lesser genre, and one with which a poet such as William Collins was too easily satisfied. Um, and because she employs the forms very often of an earlier period, Barbold's poems uh, may be perceived as merely conventional, and several have argued uh, that they um, 
they, that actually they employ a reformist mode that's more progressive than contemporary meditative first-person lyrics by Wordsworth and Coleridge, and that what differentiates her poetics from those more celebrated programmes is the way the speaker is, as it were, included with her audience. She's not distinct from that audience. Uh, and that may be disquieting. The poetry may be disquieting because it doesn't allow for stable irony. Um, as those of you who know the exchange to which I alluded, the exchange between Barbold and Mary Wollstonecraft, uh, that's instigated um, by Wollstonecraft quoting in full Barbold's poem to a lady with some painted flowers in a footnote in order to uh, chide it and it ends with an unpublished uh, rejoinder uh, in a famously full poem called The Rights of Woman, you know, a newly canonical. Um, we'll, we'll understand what I'm alluding to. But uh, all the same, until someone comes up with some new contextual information to shed light on that exchange, we're not going to be able to pin down the ideological interests uh, that irony uh, is serving. Um, now, we know about Priestley's chiding Barbol for her admission uh, of taste because of the publication of a, a private letter in the Tal Rutt edition of Priestley, uh, which appeared between 1817 uh, and 1831. Now, I don't know this, but I'm assuming that this uh, means that the, the, the letter was actually published in Barbol's lifetime. She died in 1825. The letter appears in the, uh, the first double volume of that edition. Um, now, I mention this because the theory of networks can represent female discourse, but that discourse isn't always readily available, or its status is kind of odd. It may have been oral, evanescent, or occasional. Um, and Barbell herself dispraises the occasional. It's something that is limited by the occasion that produces it. Now, our, our rubric today is... is uh, faith communities, and I want briefly to look at one way in which Barbold supposedly revises Priestley's severe rationalism, and then at, the, uh, at her account of the social benefits that there might be in such a revision through her idea of meeting, where she uses the term uh, meeting, uh, as in my title, which of course I've forgotten, hallowed by the occasion of the meeting, a quotation um, from uh, the, 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 the prose work that I want to talk about. Um, but let's start with a, uh, one of Barbell's... Oh, there's Priestley. Uh, Gunpowder Joe, period. There he is. Uh, this is, um, I think, significantly without the wig. You know, the <laughs> Enlightenment uh, uh, consists in partly in divesting yourself of the, of the wig, so I think this is probably uh, Pennsylvania era, Priestley. Shouldn't be there. This is, um, this is the only Barbell's uh, poem to uh, Priestley, Champion of Truth. Sorry if that's... I don't really need that, more or less. Anyway, it, but it's a very... Um, it's, this is one of eight extant poems that um, she addressed to the Priestleys, uh, Mary and Joseph, uh, interestingly, um, whom she knew over 30 years when they'd been colleagues at Warrington Academy in the 1760s. And this poem begins by addressing uh, Priestley as scientist and theologian, champion of truth, whose eccentric, piercing, bold insights uh, penetrate both uh, nature's field... Um, in, the, in that first line, and the sacred leaves of scripture. So Priestley is the champion both of natural and revealed religion. And having first represented her friend in the most public of terms, Barbold's poem then changes tack and goes on to mourn the absent friend, regretting the loss of the social hours which charmed us once. Uh, I'm on that one there. Yeah, this is, and this is the way that uh, then the poem goes into something else. But the poem moves from traversal of the world as, as object of knowledge in that first, uh, those first few lines uh, to sociability in the last. We go from nature's field to um, uh, nature's rural face in the, in the last line. Um, so there's a sense that Priestley may go astray, not just, in leaving, um, not just in leaving Warrington, which is when the occasion of this poem, uh, but in being uh, diverted by uh, the pursuit of, 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 of truth, of certainty. And that anticipates a much better known poem of, of 25 years later that Barbold addresses to another fellow Unitarian, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, um, in which she adjures the younger author not to lose his way in the maze of metaphysic law, suggesting that the pilgrim's true path is to be found uh, by a parent. And that, um, there is a generational difference, of course, between Barbold and Coleridge, but it always kind of surprises people that the Barbold takes that posture. 
uh, towards the poet who these days is much better known. Um, and Coleridge, uh, of course, writes a sonnet to Priestley, which interestingly concludes in similarly uh, parental terms. Uh, Coleridge's sonnet ends, Meet nature slowly lifts her matron veil to smile with fondness on her gazing son. Um, the interesting thing is that the parents' love that Barbell talks about is not maternal. It's kind of generally, um, it's a, gen a much more general benediction, it seems to me. And it's not gender. There are, however, um, uh, gender terms at work in the character of, of, of Priestley, um, in which he seems to be, Priestley seems to be the impetuous river uh, of these lines, um, rushing between firm banks and repelling tides, um, while she stresses the alternative uh, pleasures to be had in those last lines from following the river's winding path through flowers and scenery. So these are clearly gendered uh, terms. Um, so clearly there's a, a, a contrast to be, to be drawn with uh, Priestley, but not only in uh, gender terms. Um, one, I think one of the crucial uh, differences is, is their, um, the way they differ uh, on the use of the, of the aesthetic, of taste. Uh, Priestley recalls having uh, the Puritan's great aversion, to, that's the term he uses, the great aversion to fiction uh, from childhood. And um, in, the, in the memoir that opens the, the collected edition of Priestley, recounts uh, previously throwing away his brother's book of uh, night, night errantry. And the anti-aesthetic stance that suggests um, wasn't always borne out by the, by the practice. His first published work uh, was, a, a, was a poem, and he boasts of his own enabling role uh, in uh, the production of Barbold's work. But all the same, Priestley, who acknowledges no differences among his reading audiences, um, there's not much discernible difference between those works which are supposedly expositions of difficult stuff for children uh, and, and that which uh, is, is addressed to a, 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 an adult uh, audience. Uh, and Barbold, who of course uh, is uh, famous as uh, becomes famous as a uh, writer of works for children, um, and who seems to be sensitively addressing your interlo interlocutors on a one-to-one -one basis. You know, these two might seem to be playing clear gender roles. She herself seems to accept in an early poem addressed to her brother that she will be consigned to what she calls the more humble works and lower cares appropriate to her gender, despite the fact that they've received an identical education. Um, but seeking uh, what he calls conviction all the time, Priestley, uh, Priestley uh, talks about uh, the end of argument being conviction, getting his auditors uh, or readers conviction rather than consensus. Um, so he finds only a restricted space for the, for the effective, for the aesthetic, whereas Barbold sees the effective to be compatible uh, with the search for truth uh, or what she often calls utility, um, which I mentioned because I think one place that Unitarianism goes uh, after the 1790s is uh, utilitarianism. Uh, and um, the, the, the interface of utilitarianism and Unitarianism is uh, something that uh, people like Isabel Armstrong uh, have been working on uh, recently. Uh, Isabel Armstrong talks about a Unitarian poetic that finds support in Priestley's aesthetics and employs an emancipatory ecumenical and communitarian rhetoric. Uh, more broadly, in a piece that some of us looked at in yesterday's proceedings, Daniel E. White has argued that the dissenting interest Barbold represented didn't constitute a counter-public, but rather that the, the dissenter's sphere of intervention was necessarily an intermediate space between the private realm and the state. And of course, such a position may also necessitate an intermediate mode of address and a way of speaking that is neither private nor public, but somehow mediates the two, and that aspires to the egalitarian qualities that uh, Armstrong identifies. And that's what, um, that aspiration at least, is to be seen in Barbell's contribution to a controversy on public worship, which is what I want to uh, talk about. Um, so Barbell, I think, addresses her actual or implied readers in the 1790s through a vocabulary not exclusive to dissenters, of address and petition, and of what in her, uh, another poem to Priestley, where she um, writes an, inventor, in, an, inventor, an inventory of his uh, uh, study, him being absent uh, at, at Warrington, she calls answer, remark, reply, rejoined. I mean, this is what characterizes Priestley's writings. Um, and in the 1790s, of course, 
forms themselves, like the romance or the, or the ballad, might signal political uh, affiliation. And even the works for children, for which Barbold was probably best known, uh, might, as Emma Major has uh, observed, come to be read as sinister, fraught with insidious uh, intent. So that in the, in the bigger piece of which this um, talk is a, is a part, um, I've been concerned with the, uh, the difference made by genre, you know, whether poems can actually be political in the same way as is discursive prose in that decade. Um, how, how am I going to time here? Ten, I'm just wondering whether to cut. Um, just wanting to, to cut the controversy with uh, Priestley and cut to the uh, um, cut to the chase, such as it is. Yeah, I think I will. Uh, so uh, what I wanted, to, what I was going to talk about was um, the, the, the famous but only apparent uh, disagreement between uh, Priestley and uh, Barbel over uh, uh, an essay which she, uh, she writes initially uh, as the, 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 the preface to a volume of selections from the, uh, the Psalms uh, and other uh, biblical uh, poetry, where she talks about the, uh, uh, the aesthetic, she talks about taste as uh, an element in religious uh, devotion to which Priestley uh, ob ob objects. Um, so I'm happy to talk about that either straight after this or uh, uh, later on, but I w what I wanted to really talk about was um, the notion of religious uh, community, that being our rubric. So I wanted then to talk about Barbold's contribution, at uh, first it was anonymous, to a controversy um, occasioned by Gilbert Wakefield's pamphlet on public worship. Uh, this pamphlet appeared in April 1792. And Wakefield's pamphlet, um, which went through three editions in that year, argued against attendance at church, uh, at church services on the grounds that there was no scriptural precedent for them. Christ never attended a service, but instead taught the disciples how to petition the Lord individually. Um, and besides Barbold, the half dozen respondents uh, to Wakefield's pamphlet included Mary Hayes. Wakefield calls her and Barbold Amazonian auxiliaries in the controversy. Uh, and, uh, and Priestley. Um, this is part of. Uh, sorry, that's. Uh, I want to get the whole of this paragraph on, so the, uh, the font may be a little taxing for you. I'll read it aloud to you in a minute. But there are there are a couple of surprising things about this uh, uh, reply. Um, the first is that its mode of address is resolutely discursive and objective, despite Wakefield's closeness to the to the family. Uh, Wakefield's pamphlet is dedicated to Barbold's brother, uh, John Aiken, and, and he, Wakefield, became father-in-law uh, to Charles Aiken. Having left the Anglican ministry years earlier, Wakefield, only a few months before, resigned as classical tutor at the dissenting academy in Hackney, where he uh, refused to attend Christian worship. Uh, Wakefield's pamphlet is a bad-tempered justification. He says in reply to his critics, the mode of prayer among dissenters always appeared to me unedifying and intolerably irrational. Uh, and Barbel doesn't refer to any of this. She gets no closer to ad hominem its attack than to suggest that Wakefield may be inclined, and I quote, to undervalue that fellowship which has been lost to him between his early predilections and his later opinions. The second thing that may be surprising about Barbel's reply is that his arguments are almost entirely secular. There's an interesting uh, anti-Calvinist polemic at the, uh, at the end that someone quoted yesterday. But there's surprisingly little uh, about requirement for or coercion to church going, and nothing about the dissenting conventicles as against the Anglican uh, church. But this is the passage, maybe I should read it because of the, uh, the font, but this is the passage I wanted to, us to think about, uh, where Bible does talk about what a religious community might consist in. Uh, she says, even the common greetings that pass between those who meet at church are hallowed by the occasion of the meeting, and the spirit of civic urbanity is mingled with a still sweeter infusion of Christian courtesy. By the recurrence of this intercourse, feuds and animosities are composed, which interrupted the harmony of friends and acquaintance, and those who avoided to meet because they could not forgive are led to forgive, being obliged to meet. Its effect in humanising the lower orders of society and fashioning their manners to the order and decorum of civil life is apparent to every reflecting mind. The poor who have not formed a habit of attending here remain from week to week in their sordid cells or issue thence to places of licentiousness more sordid, while those who assemble with the other inhabitants of the place are brought into the frequent view of their superiors. Their persons are known, their appearance noted. The inquiring eye of benevolence 
pursues them to their humble cottages and they're not unfrequently led home from social worship to the social meal. If the rich and poor were but thus brought together regularly and universally, that single circumstance would be found sufficient to remove the squalidness of misery and the bitterness of want, and poverty would exist only as a sober shade in a picture of life on which the benevolent eye might rest with a degree of complacency when fatigued with the more gaudy colouring uh, of luxury uh, and show. Now that, I think, is, is couched in a uh, familiar idiom which is um, surprising perhaps only because of who's employing it. Um, public worship, as well as every other practice, it says, must stand on the basis of utility and good sense, or it must not stand at all. So there's one kind of, um, uh, in, uh, well, like the library, of, of an enlightenment ideal uh, of shaft with amicable collision, say, in this picture of the church uh, as a civic institution. The language of congregation is used here in a, in a civic sense. You know, the church brings people together, thereby fulfilling a secular, if not political, functions of narrowing the gaps and smoothing out social and other differences between them. And the Christian occasion is represented in carefully ecumenical language. This function uh, is performed in church, but not performed by a church. It's in meeting there that language is hallowed. So the, the church for Barbell is ideally an institution in which social and ideological differences uh, might be cancelled or in which uh, they might at least coexist. It's not unlike the blue stocking claim for their assemblies, a claim that Barbell rejected in favour of this much more inclusive kind of assembly. But there's also, obviously it seems to me, uh, a political slant in the way that she claims that those who attend are thereby humanised. Uh, the mixing of classes at church allows a higher class to invigilate the poor and even pursue them home. You know, these are symptoms of benevolence. Uh, yes. These are unsuspected benefits of meeting. Um, it's not that Barbell blurs the distinction of devotional and secular, but that the two are associated, as in a, a, a line um, from a later poem, 1811, uh, in which religious light and freedom's holy flame are mixed. Now, there's a uh, an association clearly between the political and the religious, but it's never as simple uh, as, as, as is sometimes claimed. Um, so Barbell doesn't engage Wakefield in questions of scriptural precedent or justification in arguing for the benefits of civic association. Um, and instead of reiterating the grievances dissenting congregations might have with the Anglican Church, she adopts an attitude rather like that of the title of one uh, contribution to the debate, civil mandates for days of public worship, no argument against joining it. Yeah. In other words, um, you, should still, you should continue to pay your taxes when they are spent on things of which you disapprove, because this is only what she calls passive concurrence. Obeying the law is no more than accepting that it expresses the general opinion, or general will, she uses both those phrases. Um, so the legal obligation for dissenters to pay tithes, tithes uh, for instance, was an injustice they were taught to bear until the tolerance afforded at the ethical or personal level might be matched by toleration at a public or political level. So Barbold's reply to, to, to Wakefield is addressed explicitly to fellow dissenters. However, the address is uh, inclusive. Only the gloomy Calvinists are left outside. Um, and quite right, too. Um, <laughs> in associating uh, with others and in the rituals and repetitions of collective worship there's a stay against the secularisation evident uh, all round her so once again right thinking Anglicans too would be friends of moderation and good sense and she, she appeals uh, to them as well um, two minutes how, how long? two minutes two minutes big finish then okay uh, take forever <laughs> Um, in the essay that I didn't talk about on the devotional taste, one thing that Barbell does is to trace a historical movement from the austerity and severity of the little communities, as she calls them, of early Christianity to a present, in which, um, from the absence of opposition, springs a fatal and spiritless indifference. She doesn't want assimilation, but to maintain uh, a difference, an enlivening difference with an Anglican establishment. The discourse of groups excluded from a dominant discourse must always be a reaction to it. Sects are always strict, she, she writes, in proportion to the corruption of establishments and the licentiousness of the times. 
And she praises in these terms, for example, uh, the famous mode of address among Quakers, whose insistence on being, uh, well, Quakers and, of course, Yorkshire folk, um, <laughs> the, um, whose insistence on being all, regardless of gender or, or social rank, uh, she says, served to check that strain of servile flattery and Gothic compliment so prevalent in the same period, and to keep up some idea of that manly plainness with which one human being ought to address another. So, despite its sectarian origin, the mode of address is neither willfully idiosyncratic nor the means by which individuals are interpolated into a dominant ideology. What rather characterises Barbold's uh, exercise of address in, in, in poems, I think, as well as uh, prose, as here, is a call to readers of goodwill to act on their sense of civic or ethical calling. Um, now, earlier on, I quoted Isabel Armstrong's term Unitarian uh, poetics, a term that I like, but I'm not sure that I'm entirely comfortable with. Uh, the term I've been working with myself for all this is a much older one, the term uh, rhetoric, which I, you know, the, the ways in which one person tries to persuade uh, another and, and for what purpose. Um, Hazlitt, uh, William Hazlitt, found uh, similarities uh, between Barbold's polemical prose of the 1790s and the formal ways in which the poems work. She strews the flowers of poetry most agreeably round the borders of religious controversy. Uh, but there is the significant difference, I think, uh, between uh, the way those genres operate is that the ideal of community is recorded by the prose, as here, while the manifold births, marriages and deaths, the continuities of friendship, sustained moral example, and other negotiations with the actual are represented in the poems. Um, her addressees in the poems uh, are not so much summoned as joined to the voice of the speaker, or rather rejoin her as commonly realised participants in a conversation which may have political but cannot have sectarian consequences. In the prose, those answering the call to a meeting lay aside social and political affiliations at the church door. However, in the pursuit of ethical terms, any member of a congregation may also discover political entitlements. The church is also a place where, by contemplating his duties, he may become sensible of his rights. So there's a claim for a universal ethical subject possessed of rights not dissimilar to the one made the same year by Mary Wollstonecraft uh, in her vindication. Claims which, of course, become uh, dangerous after 1792. I hope I've got this on. This is a bit from... Uh, uh, oh, not that. Yeah, there we are. This is... Uh, talking about rights, but this is uh, Piggott's Political uh, Dictionary. Um, um, by 1795, of course, uh, Pitt and Grenville's Seditious Meeting, Meetings Act made explicit the politicisation of the term uh, meeting. Um, in former times, it was deemed legal for... Uh, for uh, and so on. Anyway. Um, in 1792, however, Barbold wrote that uh, worshippers at church might find, uh, rather than the cancellation of their class interests, the means for legitimation of those interests. So as such, she writes boldly, those who meet at, at church perform a political act to which revolution had given a name. Every time social worship is celebrated, she says, it includes a virtual declaration of the rights of man. Thanks for your attention. Thanks very much, Steve, for keeping to time. Uh, I'll keep introductions short because if I extend it, I'll be eating into the speaker's time. I'm really pleased to introduce the next speaker, who is uh, Professor Les Woodcock, who is something of a priestly himself, although he's, he's modestly enjoying me not to mention this. I can't forbear to tell you that he is Emeritus Professor of Chemical Thermodynamics at the University of Manchester, but he's not planning to blow us up, not literally anyway. Uh, today is also president of the Jersey Priestess Society, and it's in that capacity where really, it's going to speak to us today. So thank you much. Lovely to thank you. Thank you. Historians of science don't sit very comfortably uh, with real scientists. They say we can't put things in context. Um, so at first I'll just say thank you to David for inviting me to this event. I learned a lot yesterday, and in maybe a future we, we can begin to put things in context <laughs> if I keep talking to you guys. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> okay, uh, Joseph Priestley, the name needs no introduction to, uh, to everybody here, in, in fact most people in Leeds. Um, 
There's the statue in, in the city square. It just says Joseph Priestley. It uh, doesn't tell us very much. The plaque on Mill Hill Chapel, it just says he was the discoverer of oxygen and he was the minister from 1767 to 1773. Again, it doesn't tell us very much. Uh, in fact, most people, uh, if even local people, they're not aware of all the great achievements of Joseph Priestley in all the different areas of uh, education, science, religion and politics. I just wanted to the beginning, uh, the dissenters and evangelicals, of course there's anybody who wasn't a member of the Church of England was a dissenter, uh, but there were passive dissenters and active dissenters. I would say Joseph Priestley was a militant yeah. dissenter. Um, but evangelical, no. He was probably a product of evangelicals, but he was exactly the opposite. He, uh, he became eventually a Unitarian that rejected all the, uh, uh, the evangelical aspects of Christianity. Um, so, um, The Priestly Society, uh, we're a charitable organisation. We've, we've been going 10 years. We, we, uh, we were formed on the... Uh, uh, to colloquium to celebrate the 200th anniversary of Priestley, Priestley in, in Bursal, where Priestley was born, uh, and, and Hetman Dwight, where he was brought up. Um, there in, there's a statue in Bursal Marketplace. We actually had the 100th birthday just last October. And this inscription on the old hall, which is now a pub in Hetman Dwight, it just says, it tells us a little bit more. It says, scientist and reformer. Uh, Joseph Priestley, born at Fieldhead, died in Northumberland, and he lived longer in Hetman Dwight than anywhere else in his life, about 11 years. So we began as a local organisation, and we commissioned an artist to, uh, to paint pictures to put the clock back to 100 years of various places where his parents were married, where he was born at Fieldhead, uh, brought up at the Old Hall, where his family worshipped as Calvinist at the small chapel in Hetman Dwight, Batley Grammar School there he attended, uh, attended classes also at Whiteley, private classes, there's the old hall as it is today, and, these, and all these are published in a small booklet, the Priestly Society uh, has a small income from publications, I always use these events to try to sell them, this <laughs> is <laughs> £20, Joseph Priestley, a celebration of his life and legacy, terrific amount of new information from the colloquia and symposium that we had uh, uh, now about eight years ago and this is a more recent one Joseph Priestley Friends and Foes uh, he had uh, friends in uh, high places in the United States the first three presidents for example uh, but his foes of course were the, the king and the uh, uh, establishment and the prime minister of, uh, of, of Britain um, so uh, this is about the, about the politics this is, this is about all aspects of his life and anybody local for three pounds you can buy this uh, Joseph Priestley, a Yorkshire heritage, which is about Priestley's life mainly, uh, up to about 21 years old. Or, or it includes Leeds as well, up to about 35 years old in Bristol, Hetman, Dwight and Leeds. Um, that's the, uh, the sales pitch. Now, so, going back to Priestley, his mother died when he was six. He was adopted by an aunt who had no children in Hetman, Dwight, and he was brought up as a Calvinist. Uh, at, uh, up at Independent Chapel, Hetman Dwyck, and this is the artist's impression. Uh, when he was 18, uh, he would have become a member of the church, uh, and uh, he had the interview with the church deacons, and they refused him membership because he questioned the doctrine of original sin. Uh, and th this, it was it, it, this is the story of Peace's life, he questioned everything, religious, scientific, uh, social everything, uh, but despite being refused membership of the church, uh, this is actually in the church records of Upper Chapel that still exist. He went to be a student at Daventry Academy, where he trained for the ministry, and his first two ministries uh, were fairly uneventful at Needham Market in, in Suffolk, and the second one at Nantwich in Cheshire. Uh, the second ministry is he now because he also had a small teaching class. And we told he was the first person in England to teach girls as well as boys. And that's how foresighted he was. <clears throat> then he moved on to Warrington Academy, which we've heard quite a lot about already. Uh, 1761 is the 200, yes, last year was the 250th anniversary of his first publication, Rudiments of English Grammar, which was the first of 200 publications in all areas of education, science, religion, politics. 
Uh, he reformed education to a level that put Warrington Academy within a few years above Oxford and Cambridge by introducing science and humanities into the curriculum. Uh, he designed these globes, which still exist. One is a, 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 a globe of the Earth with, without Australia, and the other one is, is what the globe of the uh, celestial, what you see when you look up, for teaching. He was the first person, he's, he's already got a place in the history, history which is called historiography. He was the first historian uh, to produce a timeline of history. Uh, and on top of all that, so in the next few years, there isn't a year goes by without some 250th anniversary of some great achievement of Joseph Priestley. Uh, I think this is his greatest uh, scientific achievement. He's, he's credited with the discovery of oxygen. But Priestley actually discovered and published Coulomb's Law uh, 20 years before Coulomb in this book, which is actually there in Reed's library in, in Jeffrey's archive. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't have a copy. Uh, in which he, he describes the law that holds all uh, particles that compose all atoms and molecules together. It's immensely more important than oxygen, yet nobody knows. Um, um, so uh, historians of science haven't really been too kind to Joseph Priestley and I sometimes give a talk discovering the discoveries of Joseph Priestley because there's still quite a lot to discover so after Warrington Academy he moved to Leeds and then I just used this quote this is the first portrait of Priestley when he was about 34 in Leeds I became a Socinian uh, and the Socinian were basically they were the predecessors of the Unitarians. They believed that Jesus was just a person, that there was no divinity, uh, no miracles, uh, no resurrection. Um, and uh, Priestley, so at this, this stage now, he's back in the ministry at Mill Hill Chapel, which should have, I guess was Presbyterian then, but uh, he immediately admitted to basically uh, uh, not believing much of the Gospels. It and, and was basically one of the founders of the Unitarianism, though in this country he's, he kept a low profile and is not credited with that. Um, so, uh, uh, so Sinian is, is an adherent to 16th and century theological movement, uh, and this, this, these were the predecessors of the, of the Unitarian movement, uh, which Priestley was involved in from this point in time. For the, next, for the rest of his life, he never changed his views. Uh, So, whilst at least I, I'm not really going to talk about political and civil liberty, but this, I think, is his greatest political achievement. This is eight years before the American Declaration of Independence. Uh, and Priestley wrote this essay. He was the first person to give a, a formal definition of political liberty, which is the right to, to basically elect uh, political leaders. Civil liberty, the free to uh, of control over your own actions. But more important, throughout his life he, he fought for religious liberty, which is basically separation of church and state uh, with freedom of religious expression and no government control. And in this publication he says there's no society on earth uh, was ever formed in the, this manner. So it's actually an incredible foresight in, in political philosophy. Uh, and it was eight years before the very first country that actually put all these principles that Priestley advocated uh, in, into the, uh, the Constitution and the amendments by Jefferson that Priestley eventually befriended. So he, he had an immense contribution to politics and I think this legacy is much more important than any of his scientific discoveries because somebody else would have got the science but he was effectively an adopting founder father of the United States and its constitution. The unity enjoy the right of a citizen whether he choose to conform to the establishment. Or not. So and he, this obviously didn't meet with the approval of King George III and, and his bishops and, and the establishment and, uh, and from this point on Priestley is basically He's, uh, he's going to be persecuted to some degree by the establishment for the, for the rest of his, uh, his life. At the same time, uh, in Leeds, he was living next to a small brewery, and he took an interest in gases, and the, the, the gas that came off from brewing beer, and uh, he designed, to investigate it more carefully, he designed a new, what's called a pneumatic trough, and... Uh, he also used mercury because carbon dioxide dissolves. And then from 1768 to a, a period of something like 32 years, he didn't just discover oxygen, he discovered 11 gases. And he characterised all their properties. 
uh, and uh, these are just examples. Even before they got oxygen, they got nitrogen and all the oxides of nitrogen, the first surgical anesthetic, and then he went on. The last one that he discovered was actually in Northumberland, Pennsylvania, carbon monoxide. Um, it's not coincidence, it's the last one he discovered before he died, but he did sample all the gases. <laughs> he, uh, so at exactly the same time he was doing this early scientific work on, on gases, um, he wrote an address by the centre, so he's, he's obviously thinking science and he's thinking religious at the same time, but there isn't really that much conflict at this stage. He says, a free address to Protestant dissenters as such, by a dissenter. This was actually anonymous. This has been, the signature has been put onto my version. So I was surprised to learn that he published anonymously because he was a fairly fearless person. Um, this was in 1769. He published the same address three times and the third time was in, in Birmingham in 1788. This is just two or three years before they actually tried to burn his house and his body and tried to kill him. Uh, but it's exactly the same. He hasn't changed his views, he just carries on publishing the same. He doesn't, once he's decided, made up his mind that it's science or religion, he sticks st to his views and he sticks to these views. And these are, these are very powerful arguments against the Church of England. He even, he even uses a, a bizarre argument uh, to, to justify uh, these attacks on the establishment. He says, uh, first of all, he makes no apology for this address, and then he says, as this address is directed to dissenters only, the members of the established church have no business with it. <laughs> so he's publishing it for anybody to buy for one and sixpence, but he's saying if you're a member of the Church of England, it's not your business. So you can't complain because it's an address to dissenters <laughs> by a dissenter. Amazing. And he said, and if they never look into what is not addressed to them or intended for their inspection, no offence can be taken. What's the problem? <laughs> <laughs> An amazing argument. <clears throat> but then he goes on uh, to he goes to criticise all aspects of the established Church of England and its doctrines in this area. Uh, he starts with the original sin, vicarious punishments and hierarchy, uh, conflict of persons, the power of the church, and, uh, and on and on and on. Uh, but it, it's anonymous, so uh, it, it's not until later that he publishes the same with his name to it, that he gets himself into real trouble with the uh, church. So, from Leeds he moved, he moved to, uh, to Bullwood House in Carn under the service of Lord Shelbourne, uh, where he becomes more of a scientist uh, than uh, an religious minister again. And then this is, of course, the, the famous experiments and observations on different kinds of air in which he publishes the, uh, his experiments on on the uh, discovery of oxygen. He calls it deflagisticated air. I, I, I don't do, do too much science, but the, the theory of all, why all chemicals react with one another and all physical processes take place was called the phlogiston theory. And Priestley developed the phlogiston theory. And uh, basically it assumes that any element that reacts with oxygen has associated with it some, uh, a certain amount of phlogiston. Um, which was a, uh, another element. I won't go into detail, but Priestley, more than anybody, developed the phlogiston theory by writing down chemical equations with phlogiston on one side and no phlogiston on the other side. Um, and at the same time he is doing this, in exactly the same year, 1774, he publishes this, an address to Protestant dissenters of all denominations. Uh, this is not anonymous. This is, this is still anonymous. Um, but he's, he's now... He's now trying to influence, influence the political system by appealing to dissenters uh, that, that do have a vote, which would have been very few in those days, just 2% uh, of male landowners voted. Uh, but he tries to persuade them uh, to, uh, to take into account these views on, on public liberty and especially American affairs in, in voting for the MPs. <coughs> so. One year later, after the discovery of oxygen, Priestley's adversary uh, in France, uh, Lavoisier, had invented a chemical balance, and he discovered what we call in, in science the conservation mass in all chemical equations, the mass of the reactants is equal to the mass of the products, and, and Lavoisier said, so the phlogiston doesn't exist, 
and so the theory is, is nonsense. Uh, uh, Lavoisier himself was a victim of the French Revolution. I, I won't go into that. I'm going a bit faster now because I'm. <laughs> <laughs> and so Priestley didn't just discover the gases. He went on. He went on to investigate. This is called Dr. Priestley's bonding car. He went on to investigate the. Uh, role of oxygen and carbon dioxide in plant and animal life. So he, he was the very first person to show that plants actually breathe in, breathe in carbon dioxide through the photosynthesis and breathe out oxygen. And if Priestley knew what they were, some people, politicians were doing now in the name of global warming with carbon dioxide, which is a gas of life, he would turn in his grave. Um, because the carbon dioxide is very much a gas of life and it's 6% in the atmosphere. Priestley would not agree with, with global warming. Um, but he discovered and characterized the, the uh, process of photosynthesis. Um, and now for the first time in 1777, we have a publication which actually mixes science with religion. It addresses the question of materialism <coughs> and the uh, existence of the soul or the spirit, which was part of the, the established church doctrine. Uh, but whilst he's doing this, nobody previously had written, in the, there was one Russian who had written about the existence of atoms. Priestley actually defined, he thought and thought and thought, and he deduced that we're all made of atoms that must attract and repel to hold solids together. Or, uh, and he, he goes into detail, or he, an atom is only impenetrable to any other atom, it must be around or have some shape, it must be, be divisible, in fact, Priestley said atoms were divisible uh, how, 100 years or more before Dalton, who was credited with atomic theory, said everything consists of atoms are indivisible. But uh, another 50 years later, Rutherford in Manchester split the atom. Priestley had incredible, incredible foresight into atomic theory uh, so some, some 50 or so years before Dalton. <coughs> But in the same, so this this really hasn't become part of the history of science because most people don't even know about it. Even the historians of science haven't recognised this. Uh, and in the same in the same publication, uh, he then considers the mutual influence of soul and the body, and he comes to the conclusion that there cannot possibly be any such concept of spirit or soul. He describes it as an impossibility. It's a difficulty, and he gives all the reasons again. It's an absolute impossibility. So he's, he, he's immediately rejecting the, uh, the, the, the basically established doctrine of that the a human body is, is both material and spiritual. He said it's just material. And when we die, we go back to where we were before we were born, basically, uh, inanimate elements. <coughs> uh, so still not having explained... Uh, Photosynthesis and plant life, Priest is now thinking about oxygen and animals. Uh, in 1776, he wrote in the Transactional Royal Society of London observations on respiration and the use of blood. And then, some many years later, in 1790, he, he kept improving on his understanding and he wrote down the equations for the reaction of oxygen with blood and how it carries the air around the system to feed the, the muscles and so on. He wrote down this equation, D plus just oxygen plus blood gives carbon dioxide, which we breathe out, uh, plus phlogiston. So here we are, 15 years after Lavoisier said phlogiston can't possibly exist. Priestley is stuck to his guns, and there were two schools, the phlogistonists and the antiphlogistonists. So one by one, all the, anti all the phlogistonists became antiphlogistonists except Joseph Priestley. <laughs> he was the only person in the world who still believed in the phlogiston theory. And he stuck to it to his dying day. Uh, so, <laughs> here he is. Uh, he, he'd got enemies, religious enemies, scientific enemies of the French. The French uh, scientific community were completely opposed to Priestley's ideas and, and his continuation of phlogiston theory. Uh, they said this religious adversary is a stubborn crank. Stubborn, the, the scientific said he was stubborn. Stubborn, stubborn he might have been. Uh, he, yeah, a Yorkshireman from Bristol. <laughs> <laughs> stupid he was not. And 
uh, his incredible insight. Uh, and his political adversaries, of course, they used it against him and to put these cartoons in the newspaper. And it, it, it was cartoons like this that eventually led to his vilification of the, Bir the Birmingham riots. Um, no. Now, just a few seconds of real science. 100 years after Priestley, the great American scientist J.W. Gibbs, who is a founding father of chemical thermodynamics, explained why all chemicals react, and in fact all physical and chemical processes occur, because there's a driving force, is a quantity called Gibbs free energy. And everything that reacts with oxygen has associated with it an amount of Gibbs free energy. J.W. Gibbs was a mathematician and a mechanical engineer. If J.W. Gibbs had been a chemist, it, well, he probably wouldn't have made the deductions because there's some difficult math. But if J.W. Gibbs had been a chemist, he would have called what we now call Gibbs free energy phlogiston. <laughs> they didn't know, before chemical thermodynamics, they didn't know the difference between mass and energy. And you look back at Priestley's equations with phlogiston and, and Priestley's description of phlogiston, and he said, we can't weigh heat, we can't weigh light, but we know there's something driving chemical reactions. He was very, very close but they didn't do any chemical thermodynamics. So I could argue that Priestley was right all along, and that's why he stuck to the phlogiston theory to his dying day. <coughs> this is, I, I published a paper five years ago in the American uh, Bulletin for the History of Science. On it. And so here we go to, to Birmingham, then the church in Kimbob, they gave Priestley a warm send-off. He decided to go to the U.S. He basically had gone, he'd gone too far in the eyes of the establishment and... Uh, this was almost certainly orchestrated by, by much higher powers than the local mob. <clears throat> uh, in the United States, uh, he, this is the house that he built. Uh, he, it's now a museum, Joseph Priestley House Museum. The highest award, well, the, the American Chemical Society is the world's largest scientific organization. It was found, founded on the 100th anniversary of Priestley's discovery of oxygen in his honor. And this, the highest award of the American Chemical Society to any side, is the Priestley Medal. This is the one that's going to Linus Pauling. Uh, and Priestley's also been recognised by the political establishment. Here he is on a 20, 20 cent stamp. No similar recognition in the 200 years has, has, has ever been afforded to Priestley in this country. Uh, am I okay for you got that? One minute and a half. Okay, one minute. So <laughs> here we are in Philadelphia, then back, back to religion. And in, 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 he basically took his Unitarian ideas with him to Philadelphia. And this is the first uh, Unitarian church in the United States. It's on Chestnut Street in Philadelphia. And inside the church, there's this plaque and bust of Priestley. Um, and this, uh, he, he wrote... Uh, the same time, it's 1796 that this was formed, Priestley wrote the Discourses on the Evidences Relieved, Revealed Religion. It's basically, it's a, it, it completely describes the Unitarian Church. It's a church with no hierarchy. Uh, nobody tells you what to believe. Uh, they don't believe in miracles. They don't believe in the resurrection. Anybody is free to have their own idea. Basically, it's a religion for agnostics, but it's a Christian faith because they believe in the Christian values. Uh, and the inscription, it says, if I'm going to make it, it says, theologian, philosopher, scholar, one of the ablest <coughs> and most eminent exponents of Unitarian Christianity. A leader in scientific research, his life was consecrated to the service of religion. Uh, an indefatigable student, an acute observer, prolific author in all relations, he was pure, simple, upright, humane, courageous, steadfast defender of the rights of humans. He was in her early stages against oppression, a generous friend of the United States. Why don't we have an inscription like that in Leeds? Bill Hill Chapel, discovery of oxygen, lift here. This is fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> and finally then, the very last publication of 200s was Jesus and Socrates Compared, and this basically summarizes the ideas of Socrates, of course, was a Greek philosopher with similar uh, ideas uh, to, to Christ on, on, on Christian values, 
but he worshipped different gods and Priestley's idea it doesn't really matter which god you worship because we're all free to use our own, our own imagination for any relationship with God. In 200 publications spanning 42 years Priestley questioned and he found many answers uh, in science and religion to just about everything material and spiritual. Why did he never question the existence of God? It's a fair question. He was su such a smart person. Um, maybe this can be for discussion, but uh, I think one reason is it's a question that cannot possibly be answered because scientists will never explain the origin of the universe um, and the extent of the universe. Uh, so, on that note, I'll say thank you. <laughs>
couldn't understand. They would just think and think and think and then devise an experiment to, uh, to explain it. Back here then. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you suddenly all sprung up. Like yeah. photosynthesis yeah. has been working. Yeah. 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 This is a, a question for Liz. Uh, just a comment on that, actually. Bruce Lee did um, sell his electrical machines Sorry? to the, he sold his electrical machines to the Leeds Infirmary um, through his connections with William Hay. The infirmary used his electrical machines in yeah. the treatment of patients. Um, which brings me on to, uh, to David's question about kind of this idea of community and the scientific. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about uh, what you know about William Hayes' involvement with Joseph Priestley? I was quite interested that you mentioned about Priestley's observations on the blood and to what extent possibly his, his work with William Hay had induced him to write yeah. about that. I, I don't know the name. I'm, oh, so, I'm not a historian, I'm sorry. Um, I suspect you know the answer to I that. Do, I don't know. <laughs> there, there was a a theologian called the Reverend Mitchell at Thornhill, and Priestley interacted with him and, uh, in the question of astronomy, and they eventually ex explained black holes. Uh, he was talking to other religious people, <laughs> but I ne I've never heard the name that you mentioned there, Hay? Hay, hey, William Hay. William Hay in Leeds, is that the, medi the medical? Yeah, the medical. I've heard the name, yeah. yeah I'm I don't know. Maybe Jeffrey knows more about that than that. Uh, yeah, yeah. He's a member here. Yeah, we can talk about it in your yes. paper for me. Okay. Yeah, yeah, what, what were the electrical machines used for, Becky? Becky, what were the electrical machines used for? Um, they were used for. Oh, good question. Um, well, I think. Uh, can I be treated before depression? And previously in America, Benjamin Rush, uh, yeah. Rush, uh, Martin with Benjamin had used a machine from Franklin to treat a, treat a lady body body. It was also for things like drying room as well. That was the main use of the They're not machine. related to Dr. Dr. Graham's love bed, because they were used <laughs> to treat, <laughs> where they were used, electricity was used to treat infertility. Yeah. Uh, John Wesley uh, wrote uh, a medical book, and <laughs> nearly every um, ailment he deals with ends up with saying, uh, get electrified. <laughs> it seems to be a, a, a universal panacea. Yeah. Mary knows all about that. Uh, are we all right for one more, one more question? First hand up. Quick! Oh, well, it's the lady in the corner. Yeah, it was, it was Quick hands. Very basic one. I just wondered if, if the society had any of the artifacts, you know, like the globes and. Yeah, like the, the, the globes still uh, exist in yeah, Harris Manchester College, Oxford. Ah, uh, right. Yeah. And they've just actually had them renovated. But they're in the archives, so not, it's not a museum and nobody sees them. This is a problem. There's no, never been a permanent exhibition to oh, these there anyway. So uh, they also have a lot of other artifacts at Harris Manchester College of, uh, in, uh, in North America. This Dickinson College have everything that he used for, for research in, the, in his house and laboratory in the, in the library of Dickinson College in Pennsylvania. Um, um, Leeds have a science yeah, museum. Yeah, there's two things in one of them. Yeah, a lot of yeah. this. Yeah, yeah electrical machines exist. Yeah. Um, I think there's one here in Leeds, at the university. The university does have a museum for the history of science, technology, and medicine. Yeah. Um, so it might be worthwhile. Yeah. Yeah. It's just telling us the, the boss. There's one last uh, question uh, for both. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to ask a question of both speakers, really, um, just to show it around, I mean, which was. Um, about the motive force, I mean, what we just heard about in terms of driving Priestley, um, might be to use uh, the word that Steve referred to, was conviction. What we've seen is a kind of, the, what's driving both Barbell and Priestley, I mean, you talked about truth and conviction, and you made a distinction between conviction in the case of Priestley and truth in the case of Barbell. Seems to me that, you know, in terms of what we're thinking about in terms of energy, which we've heard quite a lot about in the last mm -hmm. paper, what is the energy of these individuals and how is it being deployed and how does their achievement sit alongside their energy? So, you know, as it were, this stubborn guy from Burstow uh, has a kind of conviction which he sticks with, which, you know, in your narrative, he's always proved right mm -hmm. in a sense. Mm -hmm. Um, but I just wanted to take that, that into a wider context of what that motive force of both Barbold and Priestley is across the two papers and how significant that is for our attempt to understand 
the way in which creativity works within a network, but it also works within, as we've heard, um, the dynamic of individuals who are looking for an end product of truth or conviction or working from those. Yeah, I guess what I was what I was trying to describe was uh, a, a difference of, of, of approach to the same same heavenly city, really. Um, Priestley has disciples, but Priestley seems to me not to be interested in attracting uh, disciples. Nor is Barbold, but Barbold, uh, I think successively works, clearly works within networks, that knowledge is, 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 is produced within those, those networks. It's, it's, it's always interactive. Uh, Priestley always wants to, I, I, I think, always put the reader or the auditor in the rhetorical position of the one who has to be convinced. And that seems to be is a large difference. I'm just not convinced that we then want to map that onto a, a, a gender uh, yeah. distinction as well. Will that do yeah, it yeah, as a... Okay. No, do you want to pick that? No, no, it's... Uh, oh, I, I, right. I, well, I, I don't know anything about that, but I, I, <laughs> yeah, from right. what I learned yesterday. <laughs> well, we're bringing it to a close. It might be said the one, one thing wasn't in your notes. He was a professor of literature. In fact, his first job was in, I think, professor of belles lettres and rhetoric at Warrington. Yeah. Well, literature in some ways more generally. But anyway... Nobody's going to boast about that. <laughs> 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 well, on that note, we'll have, uh, we'll have a cup of coffee. Thanks very much.